Yeah. Okay, all right. Good morning. So uh, the plan for these lectures is uh, today we do Curves and Surfaces Part 2, and uh, Thursday and Friday we do geodesics. So the last thing that we had on the board last time was this inverse function theorem. So this is for a map from Rn to Rn, the same dimension. And what it says is that if the derivative is bijective, then so is the function, at least in a neighborhood of that point. And uh, there's a formula for the derivative of the inverse. It's the inverse of the derivative. Let me just remind you if n equals 1, right? If n equals 1, then what is the hypothesis that this be bijective? Non-zero, non right? So the, the derivative is non-zero. And what does it mean if the derivative is non-zero? It means the function is either increasing or decreasing, right? And those are the cases in which you would expect to find an inverse, right? OK, so, uh, so now we have a definition. Let's see. Anybody have any questions? All right. So we'll start with the definition. A smooth k-dimensional manifold. This is not the most general definition, but it's, it's a good definition. Uh, it's a subset m in Rn, so it's in some uh, Euclidean space, with the property that every point uh, has a neighborhood. U, a neighborhood in Rn, with local coordinates. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot something. <laughs> sorry, uh, I skipped something. All right, I'll say I have to say what local coordinates are first. Local coordinates, x1 through xn. I did say, but not not explicitly enough. Uh, so that. Um, M intersect U is the set of all points x1 through xn such that uh, xk plus 1 is equal to xk plus 2 equals xk xn. OK, so that's the definition of a manifold. But I forgot to tell you what uh, coordinate change is. I rearranged my notes last night. Sorry. So a change of coordinates. So it, it comes out of the inverse function theorem. So a change of coordinates is a smooth map, a smooth map f, from an open set u in Rn to an open set V and Rn, and it th that is a diffeomorphism. That is a diffeomorphism. And what does that mean? A diffeomorphism means it's a bijective, um, smooth bijection with a smooth inverse. OK, so we take the point of view that changing coordinates is not really doing anything. It's just calling the points by different names. So this is what a change of coordinates is. Uh, just to give you a couple examples, uh, a linear map, a linear map, L from, R, uh, from Rn to Rn is a change of coordinates, is a good change of coordinates. Provided what? When, when will a linear map be a good change of coordinates? Has to be invertible, right? So the determinant is not equal to 0, provided uh, L is invertible. Uh, here's another example that you're probably familiar with. 
Here's a map, uh, may call it F, from R3 to R3. So F of uh, rho theta phi is uh, rho cosine phi, rho sine phi, cos theta, rho sine phi, sine theta. OK, that's a map from R3 to R3. And again, according to this criterion, uh, this will be a good local change of coordinates, provided, provided what? Provided the determinant of the derivative is not 0, right? Determinant of f prime is not 0. Now, who knows? I think you know. What is the determinant of f prime? Rho squared sine phi, Did you, right? Right? So the determinant of f prime, it's, a ter ter it's, the, it's the Jacobian matrix, right? So it's the determinant of f prime is rho sine phi. So this is good, except where? Along the z-axis, right? Sine of phi, th these are spherical coordinates, right? Uh, sine phi is equal to 0 on the z-axis, right? So, so, um, so except, except along the z-axis. OK, so, so, so here's our definition of a smooth k-dimensional manifold. Um, so it's, a, again, uh, it's a subset of, of Euclidean space with the property that every point has a neighborhood where it's just the inclusion of a, of a smaller dimensional linear space. So some examples are uh, in manifolds in R2, a point is a manifold of dimension 0. That's not very interesting. Manifolds of dimension 1 would be a, a circle. Right? A circle is a manifold. Every, every point has a neighborhood. Every point on the circle has a neighborhood so that the inclusion of uh, M into that neighborhood j looks like this, right? It uh, looks like a line included in R2. Uh, another example is a line. Examples of manifolds in R3. Uh, a sphere, right? Uh, a helix. This one is, this one is a, a two-dimensional manifold. This one is a one-dimensional manifold. Uh, all the quadric surfaces except for what? All the quadric surfaces. What are the quadric surfaces? There's a hyperboloid of two sheets, right? That's a manifold. There's a hyperboloid of one sheet. That's a manifold. What else is there? Is that an ellipsoid, right? That's a manifold. Oh, there's a paraboloid, right? <laughs> Double cone, right? What about that one? <laughs> right? This one is not a manifold, right? This, this point does not have a neighborhood that looks like a two-dimensional space embedded in a three-dimensional space. OK, so um, okay, so now we have a, a theorem. And this is another theorem along the lines of uh, the uh, inverse function theorem. Remember, the inverse function theorem says, in some sense, that as goes the derivative, goes the function, right? So uh, this is uh, the immersion theorem. And again, let me remind you, I will give you my notes. I have some typed up notes from these lectures. They're not exactly the same as the lectures. They're actually longer and have more examples in them, but I will make them available at the end. Um, so they'll be online uh, at, with, the, with the conference. So this is the immersion theorem. So let's see. So suppose we have a map f from rm to rm plus m. So this, this I'm assuming that the, all these numbers are greater than or equal to 0. So this is a higher dimension than this. Uh, and suppose that f of x naught 
equals y naught. So, so if f prime of x naught is injective, so if the derivative is injective, then f prime is in, then then f is injective. In an open ball, the restriction of f to an open ball a u about x naught, and the image, the image of f respect of the restriction of f to u is, and let's see what dimension will it be. Uh, if this is an injection, it's going to look like a copy of Rm inside Rm plus k, right? So it's going to be a m dimensional, right? m dimensional manifold in Rm plus n. Okay, and it's just, the, again, it's just this, it's very similar to this one. It's a, it says that all you need is that this. Um, this derivative to be injective at, at one point. Uh, okay, right, and there's more to it too. It also says that uh, the tangent plane to the image, or the, the, the tan at the point f of x naught to the image of f. Is the image is the image of the affine map, the affine approximation map, uh, a of x is f of x naught plus f prime of x naught times x minus x. Okay, let me see if that made sense. If the derivative is injective, then f is injective nearby. And the image of f restricted to u is an m-dimensional submanifold. And we can identify the tangent plane. OK, any question about what this says? All right, let's look at a couple, uh, oh, a couple examples. And I should say that f is called, this is why it's called the immersion theorem. f is called an immersion at such a point, x naught if it satisfies these conditions. Do you, do you really need a constitution? Do you already have f of x naught? Say it again. Do you really need the approximation? Because you know what f of x naught is. And you know that the, the, the derivative is, has to have full rank. So it's just the image of the, der the derivative then. Yes, yeah. Well, th this, this formula is, sorry? Well, it, it's a plane that goes through this point, right? Yeah. And if this is 0, I don't, let me do an example. OK, all right. So uh, here's a, a couple simple examples. Yes. Yes, that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm taking some examples right now. OK. So here's an example. So here's a map f from r1 to r2. So f of t is equal to cos t sine t. OK, show that, show that f is an immersion. Everywhere, actually, this is an immersion everywhere. F uh, find a parametric form. Parametric form uh, for the tangent line. Tangent line to the image. The image of f at let's see, uh, let's say f of zero. So 
So what does the image of that look like? The image of that is a, the image of this map is a circle in R2, right? Everybody, everybody all right with that? So the image of F, the image of F is a circle. Circle of radius 1. So when t equals 0, we're at the point 1, 0. And it winds around like this. Uh, so how do we show that f is an immersion? We take the derivative, f prime of t is uh, derivative cosine is minus sine t uh, cos t. And uh, we need to show that uh, this has maximal rank, right? We want to show that this map, so that um, Let's see. Maybe I should say that this condition, right? This condition that the, the derivative be injective is the same as saying that this, ma this matrix has maximal rank, which is, in this case, is M, right? right. So note, you know, maybe I'll put that here. So note <coughs> F, F prime uh, is injective as a linear map if and only if it has maximal rank, which is rank, i.e., rank m, right? OK, so uh, and there, this, is a, this is a, what is it, 1 by 2 or 2 by 1? It's a 2 by 1 matrix, right? So the rank of this is the, the maximum, the rank is at most 1. And uh, one of these could be 0, but they both can't be 0 at the same time, right? So, this, so it does have maximal rank. Always for every t. Now you could also uh, take the absolute value of that. Take the uh, this is always a vector of length one, right? So it's never um, the derivative will never fail to be injective. So uh, show that it's an immersion. That shows that it's an immersion. Question? No, immersion. And uh, what about the tangent line? The tangent line should be the image of the affine map. The affine map is A of t is uh, f of, in this case, uh, we chose t equals 0. It's f of 0 plus f prime of 0 times t minus 0. Right? So f of 0 is, f of 0 is uh, 1, 0, right? So this is 1, 0 plus f prime of 0, f, f prime. Oh, OK, here's f prime already. So if we evaluate this at 0, we get uh, 0, 1 times t. Right? So this is uh, the vector 1 t. So where is 1 t? This, uh, the x coordinate is 1, and the y coordinate is t. So where is this line? This line is looks like this, right? And it is indeed the tangent line at this point. Um, note, however, uh, so if it's an immersion, it is at least locally injective, right? But this map is not injective, right? This map, this is taking uh, the line into R2. It's just wrapping it around and around and around. So it's not, it's not injective, although it is locally injective. So note, F is not injective. OK. so. Uh, all right, so here's another example. This one was in the, in the exercises. And I won't tell you how to do it, but you can think about it if you haven't looked at the exercises. So here's an example. Uh, find an immersion f from r1 to r2 whose image looks like this. I just want to point out to you that the image of an immersion does not have to be a smooth curve, right? There is, there, you, can, you can write down an immersion that takes R1 to R2 whose image looks like this. Right? It's not a manifold at this point, right? The image of an immersion is not necessarily a manifold. It can cross over itself.
Okay, here's another example, or maybe a non-example. F from R1 to R2, F of T is equal to T squared T cubed. Is F an immersion? Sketch the image of F and discuss. It's a perfectly lovely map, right? T squared, T cubed. Right, so this is F. What's F prime of T? F prime of T is 2T, 3T squared. Does that always have maximal rank? All right, this, it ha except where? At zero, right? So this has maximal rank. Maximal rank in this case is 1, right? Except at t equals 0. Does anybody know what the image of this looks like? It's a cusp. Yeah, it looks like this. I guess that's an exercise, too. <laughs> exercise. Uh, you can look at, you can take dy over dx, right? You see that this is looks like this. Now, <coughs> so uh, I think it's a very interesting example because, see here you're looking at t squared and t cubed. Nothing could be smoother than t squared and t cubed, right? But how does the image develop a cusp like this? Does anybody want to say how that happens? What does it do? What is the v v velocity vector at that point? When t equals 0, the velocity vector is 0. What does that mean? What did it do? It stopped, right? So it stopped. It came along like this, and it stopped, and then it went like that. But it's perfectly smooth, right? It's perfectly smooth. But perfectly smooth doesn't mean the image is perfectly smooth, right? OK. Um, all right. So now we, I think we have another theorem. So the other thing, <coughs> anybody guess what the other theorem is? This one is about a bijective map, right? This one is about an injective map. What is the next theorem going to be about? Surjective map, OK. <coughs> so this is called the submersion theorem. OK, so here's what the submersion theorem says. So we have a map now f. And uh, what are the dimensions going to be? This is from a lower dimensional into a higher dimensional. And this is two that have the same dimension. So here we're going to go from a higher dimension to a lower dimension. So I have a map f from rn plus k to rk, bigger, than, bigger here than this. and. Uh, Hang on a second. Sorry, I had a better statement of this. Um, so if f prime at uh, x is surjective at each point x, x in f inverse of uh, y naught, then the level set, the level set uh, f inverse of y naught, is a smooth manifold of dimension of dimension one. What will it be? So this is we have n plus k variables, and then we're imposing k conditions. So it should come out to be dimension. M. I'm sorry, N. N. Just to this. So, um, all right, let me do an example quickly of this. I didn't write out the most general 
theorem that I could have written out. I mean, I could have written it more to sound more like this. But this, this is actually the, the important part of it right here. Uh, yeah, that's, yeah. And that's a global statement, right? That's not a local statement. That's a global statement, which is why it's such a great theorem. OK, so uh, example. So here's an example that f of xy be xy. Sketch the level sets. Uh, OK, so um, all right, so I, I, I need another definition here. So we say that uh, uh, x is a regular point of f if uh, f prime of x is surjective. Uh, x is a critical point otherwise if f prime of x is not surjective. And uh, I guess, let's see, so, so y is a regular value. Did these funny definitions, but you'll see why, why it makes sense. y is a regular value if f inverse of y contains no critical points. No critical points. And uh, y is a critical, critical value otherwise. otherwise y is a critical value. So again, uh, if we have a map f, so this is from Rn plus k to Rk. The points are over here, and the values are over here. Right, so the points are x, x's, and the, and the values are y's. So we want to sketch the level sets of this function f. What are the regular points? What are the regular points of f? What are the regular values? Uh, looking at the level sets, so look at so uh, look at the level sets. Let's just write look at level sets, level sets, and comment. OK, so the level sets are in the domain, right? The level sets over here. Uh, let me not get rid of that. I'll get rid of this. I rearranged everything last night. All right. so. Uh, what are the level sets of x, y? So f is a map from R2 to R1. Uh, so what are the level sets? The level sets are in the domain. So this is x and this is y. So for example, we look at the level set x, y equals 1, which is uh, what? y equals 1 over x. It's, a, it's, actually, it's a hyperbola, right? It's not in standard form, but it's a hyperbola. Uh, so we can label that with 1. xy equals minus 1 is another hyperbola like this. And we can fill in xy equals 2. We can fill in lots of these level sets. They look like this. Lovely picture. And uh, did I, is there one interesting one that I didn't draw? What's the interesting one? The interesting one is xy equals 0, right? x, y equals 0 if x equals 0 or y equals 0. So this one is the union of the two, the two axes. OK, so here are the level sets. What are the regular points of f? 
So for the regular points, we need the points where the derivative is, has maximal rank. So what's the derivative? f prime is, remember how to do this? We take our function and we differentiate it with respect to x, then we differentiate it with respect to y. So it's, it's, this is actually, of course, the gradient in this case. It's y, x, right? It's a, a 1 by 2 matrix. And uh, so this has maximal rank when? Has maximal rank except when it's completely 0, right? So it has maximal rank except, except at uh, the point 0, 0. Right, so um, so what are the what are the uh, regular values of f? What are the I'm sorry? What are the regular points of f? So regular points, all points except this point right here. There's only one critical point. This is the only critical point. Zero zero. This is the only only critical. What are the critical values? What are the critical values? The critical values are the image of the critical points, right? So what are the critical? There's only one critical value, right, which is 0. So 0 is the only critical value. And what does the theorem say? So it, the theorem says that if x, the theorem says that uh, if y if y is not so the theorem says if y is a regular value, right, regular value, then f inverse of y is a smooth manifold, smooth. Manifold to dimension, whatever it is, uh, n dimensional manifold. So in this case, uh, we look at these manifolds, right? So, so wh what do the level sets look like? The level set of one is a nice smooth manifold. The level set of minus one is a nice smooth manifold. There's only one level set that's not a nice smooth manifold, and that is the um, the level set of the critical value. Okay, so you and you could also look at this picture. You could look at this picture and say, I know that 0, 0 is a critical point, right? You can tell from the picture that this has to be a critical point. So note, you can tell from the picture that 0, 0 is a critical point. You can't tell from the picture that this is not a critical point. It could be a critical point. Any of these others could be critical, but you could definitely tell that this one is for sure critical because the level set does not is not a manifold at this point. Okay. Um, another example. The three-dimensional example. Uh, same instructions. Uh, f of x, y, z is equal to x squared plus y squared minus z squared. Okay, so this is a function. This is a function from R3 to R1, right? So in this case, well, the nice level set should look like what? Manifolds of dimension 2. Right? They should look like manifolds of dimension 2. So let's see, what are the levels? Oh, there, I just erased the level sets of that function. <laughs> what do the level sets of this function look like? So same instructions as this, right? Sketch the level sets. What are the regular points? What are the regular values? Look at the level sets. OK, so uh, the level sets of this have this uh, symmetry property, right? Because this is r squared minus z squared, right? So these are rotations about the z-axis. And what are we rotating about the z-axis? Uh, this is r squared minus z squared, the level sets of r squared minus z squared. So r squared minus z squared equals 1, right, is a 
a conic section, right? It's a conic section. Uh, it intersects the r axis, but not the z axis, right? Right? You can set z equals zero and get a solution, but if you set r equals zero, you're in trouble, right? So this intersects the r. Which one is this? This is a. It's a hyperbola that opens up like this, right? The other half is not there because r is not allowed to be negative. Right, r squared minus z squared equals one, equals zero is a what? Two lines, right? This is two lines. R squared minus z squared is equal to minus one is something like this. And when we rotate the whole thing about the z axis, what do we get? We get this lovely picture. So here are the level sets. These are the level sets of this function here. Uh, there's hyperboloids of two sheets, and there are hyperboloids. There's an infinite family of hyperboloids of two sheets and an infinite family of hyperboloids of one sheet. I'll just draw one of each, right? But there's this infinitely fa infinite family. Now, j tell me something about critical points before we go on. Did anybody see a critical point? This has got to be a critical point right here, right? And we'll see that in a minute. Right, so this is, this is so f prime uh, is uh, 2x, 2y, minus 2z, right? So that's the derivative. So if we want to find uh, the critical points, the critical points are the points where the derivative does not have maximal rank. So critical points or where f prime does not have maximal rank. And in this case, the maximal rank is 1, right? Because it's a 1 by 3 matrix. And this is, this is, in order for this not to have maximal rank, it has to be completely 0. So that means uh, x, y, and z are all equal to 0. So there's only one critical point of this function. We couldn't have told that by looking at the picture, but there's only one critical point. So f has exactly one critical point. And uh, exactly one critical value, which is what? Zero, right? The critical values are the image of the critical points, right? So there's only one critical point. Zero is the only critical value. And in fact, um, if y is not equal, uh, let me call this, uh, I don't know, let me call this w. If w is not equal to 0, so th if w is not equal to the only critical value, then f inverse of f inverse of w is a smooth manifold of dimension. What's the dimension? Dimension should be 3 minus 1, which is 2, right? 3 minus 1, which is 2, which is what it is, right? These are nice surfaces of dimension 2. OK? Um, all right, so um, let me go on. I have a couple uh, more examples I want to give. I, I guess I don't have an example here of computing the, the tangent space, but I'll leave that for the exercises. Um, what's under here? <coughs> so we have defined a manifold as a subset of some bigger ambient space. We've defined an m-dimensional manifold as sitting inside, so m is like a k-dimensional manifold sitting inside Rn for some large n. Now there's a fancier definition of a manifold that doesn't even need the ambient space. It's just defined all by itself. And uh, I, I'm not going to give that here because it's simpler to just define it in this way. However, part of the game is just to pretend that we live on the manifold M and we don't see this ambient space. So that's, that's sort of part of the game. We're thinking of this manifold and you want to try to erase the ambient space and just think about what, it, what would it be like to live on the manifold M. So what would it be like? Uh, to live on M. OK, 
So I have a couple examples of this. So here's the first example. So this is the sphere, sphere Sn. So Sn is, it's the n-dimensional sphere. It's by definition the set of all points x0 through xn in Rn plus 1, such that x0 squared plus x1 squared plus xn squared equals 1. Has everybody seen that before? That's the dimension of the n-dimensional, that's the definition of the n-dimensional sphere. So um, show that Sn is a smooth n-dimensional manifold. So how do we show it's a smooth n-dimensional manifold? We're going to use the submersion theorem, right? What's the function going to be? We're going to use this function here, right? So we're going to have f. f is a map from uh, rn plus 1 to r to r, right? So this is, this is going to be our function f. x0 squared plus, plus xn squared. And what do we have to show? This is a level set of f, right? This is a level set of f. So in order to show that this is a smooth manifold, what do we have to check? Regular. It's a regular value. We have to check that, this, that, that 1 is not a critical value. So, <laughs> so you need a, to show that uh, Sn is a smooth manifold, a smooth n-dimensional manifold. We only need to show that 1 is not a critical value. We only need to show that 1 is not a critical value. Right? That's what the submersion theorem says. OK, so what is the derivative of f, right? So uh, f prime is 2x0, uh, 2x1, uh, 2xn, right? So it's this n plus 1 dimensional vector. And uh, the maximal rank for this guy is 1, right? So we only have to show that it doesn't have rank 0. And rank 0 would mean what? It's completely zero, right? So, so f prime equals zero. Uh, f f prime has has maximal rank unless x naught equals x one unless they're all equal to zero. In which case, f is equal to zero, right? So, so zero is the only. Let me put it up here. So. So 0 is the only critical value. OK? So uh, all right, so I, I want to, uh, I, guess, I guess I'm not going to complete, maybe completely get done today what I wanted to do. But uh, I want to talk about uh, what, it, what it would be like to live on this, on this surface. Um, so here we go. So if we want to, if we want to think about what it is, what it's like to live on the surface, what we want to do is we want to get local coordinates on the surface. So. Uh, so I want to specifically look at the case n equals 2. And uh, discuss the following parameterizations. Of S2, so this is the uh, 
two-dimensional sphere and three-dimensional space. So x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 1. And uh, on which part of the sphere of S2 does each give good local coordinates? And where do they come from? OK, so the first one is, so these are, what does a parameterization mean? It means a map um, gi giving local coordinates on S2. So for example, A, this is a map from R2 to R3. So it's going to be uh, x, y, z is equal to uh, u cosine v, u sine v, the square root of 1 minus u squared. Right, so this is a map from R2 to R3, right? The domain is u and v, and the range is x, y, z. Right, so this is supposed to be a parameterization of a piece of the sphere. And b is uh, x, y, z is equal to uh, u, v, uh, the square root of 1 minus u squared minus v squared. And c. Uh, x, y, z is equal to uh, cosine u sine v sine u sine v cosine v. And uh, so let's see, we want to look at the case. Where do these give local coordinates? And uh, let's see. And the hint is that these all have something to do with the standard coordinates. And uh, finally, I want to describe the height function. This nice little f of x, y, z is equal to just z, right? I guess this is h, the height function. Uh, I, sh I should say the restriction of the height function, the restriction of the height function to uh, S2. Okay. Uh, we have these three parameterizations. Let's look at the first one. Anybody know what U and V are in the first one? has something to do with the standard coordinates, x, y, z, r, theta, phi, rho. Does this look like something? U, cosine v, what's that? Yeah, r cosine theta. So u equals r, right? And what's v? v is theta, right? So can we use r and theta? to tell, to, uh, like as, as coordinates on the sphere. If I, tell you you, if I tell you you're R and I tell you you're theta, do you know where you are on the sphere? No. Hang on a second. So this is, What is R, right? On the upper half, does somebody say the upper half? Yeah, you can't, you can't do it everywhere. But uh, yeah, say on the upper half, right? So on the upper half, um, what, are, what are R and theta telling you? So, so again, you, you don't expect to get local coordinates that go all the way around the manifold. But if you look at a piece of the manifold, you can get some nice local coordinates. So if we look on the upper half at R and theta, what are R and theta telling us? R is telling you the projection onto the x a onto the onto the x y plane, right? The, so if you have a point up here, this distance, the distance from the center, this distance is R. Right? That's telling you something, right? That's telling you. Um, for example, if if you if you know R, then you can also find Z, right? Because Z is the square root of one minus R squared, right? If you know R, you can also find Z, and if you know theta, you can get x and y. So in fact, if you, know, if you know r and you know theta, 
and you're on the upper hemisphere, then you can actually say where you are. However, they're not good local coordinates at the North Pole, right? Why not? Uh, because they're not bijective, right? At the North Pole, right? Theta doesn't. T there are many thetas, right, that correspond to the North Pole, right? So these are these are good local coordinates. Local coordinates. On a piece, on a piece of the sphere, let's say that's in the upper half and doesn't include the North Pole, right? <laughs> on a piece of S2, that uh, upper half. Why do we need to? Why do we need? We need to restrict to the upper half because R is the same on the bottom half as it is on the top half, right? So this point and this point down here would have the same R and the same theta, right? This point and this point. So we need to say the upper half and uh, a piece of S2 that's in the upper half and not, not, that doesn't include not including the North Pole. All right, so what about this, these coordinates here, the second set of coordinates? We're looking for a map that will tell us how to get around on, on the sphere, right? This, this, uh, again, I want to think of the living on the sphere. So the, my whole wor universe is going to be the sphere, and I want to know how can I get around on that sphere. So what are U and V here? U and V are X and Y, right? So X is U, Y is V. So X equals U, Y equals V. So what is this? This is, this is talking about the projection of a point on the sphere onto the XY plane, right? Where are those good coordinates? Yeah, on the, on the upper half, right? These are good coordinates on the upper half, including the North Pole in particular, right? Because we're just projecting down onto the XY plane. You could, you could t take the derivatives and see what the rank is, but we're running out of time. So, so these, are, these are good coordinates on the upper half. And what about these? What is this? Yeah, but what, what are these? What are U and V? U and V are? They're theta and phi, right? I think, right? This is cosine phi. Z is rho cosine phi. So, so U equals theta. And V equals, I'm sorry, theta. V equals phi. So if I tell you where I, I'm trying to tell you where I am on the sphere, and I tell you my theta, and I tell you my phi, can, can you figure out where I am? Well, actually, I mean, if I told you my theta, right? If I told you my theta, and I told you my phi, you could actually figure out exactly where I was. But it's not, it's not bijective at the north and the south pole, right? right? So they're not good. You could tell where I was, but these are not good. So these are good. These are actually pretty good. going to work. <laughs> All right, so these are uh, good coordinates except at the north and the south pole. OK, so now um, I want to describe, so these are, these are three possible coordinate systems. I want to describe the height function. So this is the height function is just z, right? z is just the height in three-dimensional space. I want to describe the height function on S2. So, but the point is now, um, uh, the height function in terms of x, y, z is a really simple function, right? It's just this, this linear function. But I want to imagine that I live on the two sphere and I don't see the ambient space, but I'm just looking at what does this function look like to me if I live on the sphere. And in order to answer that question, I need to get out my local coordinates. Right, so, so what does the height function? So we, will, we want to look at it in local coordinates. OK, so if I live on the sphere, that's all I have is these local coordinates. Now, I am actually interested in the height function uh, uh, near the North Pole, 0, 0, 1. So what does it look like in local coordinates? Well, I've got three, three possible coordinate systems here. Is any of them good near the North Pole? 
This one, right? Th these are not good at the North Pole, but this one is good at the North Pole, right? These are good coordinates to the North Pole. So, so what is the height function? So we use these coordinates, uh, x, y, z is equal to u, v, the square root of 1 plus 1 minus u squared minus v squared. So were these are the coordinates we're going to use. And what does, in these coordinates, what does the height function look like? It looks like h of <coughs> uv, right, is this guy, right? The square root, so it's a very, it's a complicated function of the sphere. It's a simple function in 3D, but on the sphere, it just looks like the square root of 1 minus u squared minus v squared. Uh, and what do the level sets of that look like? Circles, right? So, uh, so in fact, the level sets of H, level sets of H. So I'm drawing, this is, this is in the plane now, right? The local coordinates, I have a two-dimensional manifold, so, it's, so it looks like a piece of the plane, right? And here are the level sets. And you can look at the level sets. This is the height function. And you can say, oh, look, there's a what? There's a critical point, right? So the restriction of h, restriction of h to s2 has a critical point at the North Pole. OK, so now this is a, this is a very simple example. I'm going to do a more interesting example next time. Um, but the point is that, uh, again, it's, it's not an interesting function in 3D, right? The height function is just a linear function. The level sets of this are just planes, hor horizontal planes. But when you restrict it to the sphere, it becomes an interesting function. It has a, a critical point, which is, of course, a local maximum, right? If you look at the height function on the sphere, it has a, it has a maximum at the North Pole and a minimum at the South Pole. OK, so then I'll, I'll finish up another example next time.